All right. Since we have quite a packed uh, schedule for tonight, I'm going to start right on the dot at 8 p.m. Um, once again, we are New York Emergency Medicine Student Council, and welcome to the 2023 Program Director Panel. This is one of our most anticipated events of the year, um, and we're so grateful to all the program directors who could lend their time to speak to students tonight. All right, so I wanted to give a quick shout out to our board who worked really hard to put this event together um, and works really hard to put events on every month to couple months. Um, so huge thank you to everyone who put your time to put on these free events for students interested in emergency medicine. Okay, and without further ado, I want to introduce kind of the flow of tonight's session. So we have 10 programs who will be featured tonight. Each program will have sort of five minutes to discuss uh, whatever they want about their program. Um, many have sent in slides. Um, and the schedule, a few words on the schedule is kind of loosely organized by location, emphasis on loosely. We have the upstate schools um, and then all sort of the city schools in the various boroughs and then Long Island as well. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions that we essentially selected um, from the RSVPs that students sent in. We tried to pick the most popular uh, questions, a diverse range of questions. Um, but if anyone has to leave at the hour, uh, we totally understand. Um, you have already lent your time to us. All right, so let me just make sure we've got everyone here. Okay. Do any of the directors have any questions kind of before we get started? Might as well get started a bit early. Okay, awesome. If Dr. Andonian is here and ready, um, that is our first speaker. We can wait until 8.05 then <laughs> for his slated time anyway. So hang in there, everyone. And um, if Dr. Andonian can't make it by 8.05, Dr. Bodkin, are you okay with kind of moving up to the first slot? Yep, good to go whenever you guys want me to start. Awesome. I'll give it one more minute and then you can take it away.
All right, um, let me queue up your slides. And thank you so much. Awesome, all right. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ryan Bodkin. I'm the program director at the University of Rochester Medical Center Emergency Medicine Residency Program. I'd like to thank Emily and her team for putting this together and inviting us. It's such a nice event each year and I think it's good exposure to lots of different programs across the state, which there are many really great ones to choose from. So you're gonna see a lot of great programs here tonight. Um, a little bit about our program. If you take a look in the top right corner there with that little QR code, that'll bring you to our website. So if you need more details in our program, feel free to take a look at that. You can also email me at any time. I'll put my email in the chat at the end. Um, we're a three-year program. So PGY one through three, we have 14 residents per year. And we train at a large academic center. Strong Memorial Hospital is a massive quaternary care center. That is all the things you'd expect at a center like that. We're a level one trauma center, regional burn center, stroke center, cath center, Cardiac Center of Care, um, you know, Stroke Center of Excellence. We also have ECMO, LVAD, and transplant surgery. We do transplants in kidneys as well as livers. And we're one of the only liver transplants out of New York City um, in the kind of upstate region. So we get a lot of liver disease and very, very sick patients at our institution. The really great thing about our program is that it gives you outstanding exposure to really sick incredibly complex patients, but we also have a really robust community emergency medicine experience as well. So for people that wanna get the experience in a large community center, in a small community center, or in a freestanding ED, our residents rotate at all different sites to allow them to get a really broad exposure of what emergency medicine has to offer, different practice patterns and different ways of practicing in emergency medicine. Um, University of Rochester is well known for the biopsychosocial model, which really takes into account all different aspects of care for patients, not just the biology of what's going on, but the psychological aspects as well as the social aspects of our patients. And it's something we really pride ourselves on here at the University of Rochester. Um, we have a very large, diverse faculty group from all over the country, um, so you get exposed to lots of different ways of practicing medicines, lots of fellowship programs, lots of subspecialty expertise to learn from. We have longitude those subspecialty tracks to learn from during your training program. So if you're interested in fellowship, it can give you an early exposure and some more expertise in those areas to build your CV as well as build your expertise before you start a fellowship in the future. Um, we also have a very large alumni network. We're an older program. So we started our program in 1994. So lots of alumni working all across the country, which is really great for job placement and getting our residents to places uh, that they want to be, especially impacted places where it's sometimes more difficult to find jobs due to the networking that we are able to create for our residents as they're looking for jobs in the future. And certainly, I think like most people will say here that the people are the special and the most important part about our program. You can see a picture of our three different classes there and our wonderful residents and some of our faculty members. And I think it's a real family-like atmosphere, a place where people really care about each other and a place where our residents, I think, really support and take care of each other. We kind of really solidify that the very first month that you're there with a month-long intern orientation to allow real good connection between our intern class as well as exposure to emergency medicine and our faculty group and our leadership group to create those bonds early to allow you to really have a relationship with your peers and your leadership group before you start with the real rigorous part of emergency medicine and jump into your rotations. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say. I know a lot of people have a lot of things to say, so I'm going to put my email in the chat. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to answer them, and I look forward to hearing from all the other programs here. Thanks again. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. I believe um, our next slated guest is not here yet, so we can kind of move on to the next person, which I believe is downstate, Dr. Camacho Ruiz. Oh, that was faster than I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Carolina Camacho Ruiz. I'm one of the APDs at Kings County SUNY Downstate. Um, so we are a EM, EM four-year categorical program and also a combined EMIM that is a five years. So that is something that is a, a special about our program that we really enjoy. We're very diverse, including like residents and faculty with personal and different professional backgrounds. And one of the, the most important goal of our residency is to produce residents that are very empathetic with our physicians. That is something that we're very proud of and we're going to keep continuing working on it. Uh, our department and residency program is dedicated to the patients we serve and the community from they come from. Our emergency department is a trauma level one. And it's one of the busiest uh, EDs in the country. Um, of course, the amount of pathology is very different, very staggering, and there's a lot of things that we see uh, because there's so many patients to see. So we're affiliated with SUNY Downstate College of Medicine, which produce the highest number of practicing physicians in, in your states and produce a solid background backbone for our, our academic medicine also. 
through different pathology, critical medicine, and trauma care in adults and pediatrics also, along with exposure with many subspecialties in emergency medicine. Our residents graduate very capable of taking care of a lot of like different things and also with great leadership skills that made them very competitive candidates for employment. So who we serve? We serve, we serve Central Brooklyn that we're located in close in with something that we call Flatbush. Our population is mostly Caribbean immigrants. Uh, it's a safety net hospital. Of course, with gentrification in Brooklyn, we're seeing some changes in our population, but mostly that is the highest number of our patients at this moment. And we're the safety net hospital. Our department likely is the first, first line of health care that the patients encounter in the United States when they move here or when they live here. And our curriculum is very solid in emergency in, in our, all the things that we need to know in emergency medicine. Also, we have a very solid curriculum of social EM and health uh, healthcare policy, multiple fellowships, also and very strong mentorship for our residents. Great paternally, uh, maternally and paternally leave and family leave. Even if you want to have kids or in residency, that is something that we really enjoy. Family is one of the best. Um, Things that we're very proud, we take care of our residents, we're family all together, and also we give them the opportunity to expand during residency and take care of what that is important for them that is family. Um, we're very diverse, we're very the inclusive group also from every walk of life and any distant travel. And we are also using holistic review for many years. We love it. That is the most one of the most important things that we're proud of, and we're gonna continue doing it. And of course, we are one of the biggest programs in the United States, so our uh, alumni network is uh, very big. We, we started in 1992, so there's a lot of residents all around the world that is doing amazing things. So whatever job that you want to think or any opportunities that you want to have during residency, we likely have someone in the world that is doing it. So it just takes an email to put you there. So that is uh, something that is very cool about our program. And yeah, if you have any questions, that is my email. And that is also all the clinical monster information and where you can actually reach out to us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Next we have um, Maimonides with Dr. Modi. Sorry, also catching up a little earlier than we thought, but thank you so much for inviting us. Um, I always love this seminar that you guys host because it's so cool to hear about the other programs. Um, New York City in general, I think all of our programs have so much to offer and I think we all have a lot in common. So um, it's cool that we all get to share um, with you guys. So with that, um, I'm Shivani. I'm one of the APDs and also the Meded Fellowship Director at Maimonides. Um, I've been there for eight years now. Um, so it's a place that I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, so we are a three-year program. We have 18 residents per year, so 54 residents in total. Um, our chair's favorite saying, which I feel like we always have to say, is like we are the biggest ED in the biggest borough, in the biggest city in the world. And so we have a lot to offer. Um, I think my favorite part about our hospital is our patient population. Um, like many New York City hospitals, we're really diverse. But I think overall, there's like 200 different languages of patients that we get through our ED. Um, and you get exposed to so much more than what, like what you can learn in a textbook. Like not only do you get to see your STEMIs, your strokes, your organ transplants, your LVADs, um, all of that stuff, but you also get to see see how um, immigrants come to this country and the disease processes that they come with. And a lot of people who have never really been exposed to um, good health care and good care ever in their life. And so we get to see a lot of really sick patients. Um, we have a 30% admission rate, really fantastic critical care. Um, our residents you know, obviously work really, really hard. But as you can see from a lot of these photos, they also have a lot of fun. Um, New York City is a great place to live and also a great place to learn. Um, beyond, you know, all the things that I think most of the New York City hospitals offer um, with good training, I think some of our most unique things that we do have to offer um, is our event medicine program. Our residents get to work events like concerts at Madison Square Gardens, um, the U.S. Open, which is my personal favorite. Um, they go to Yankees games. Um, next week, I think a whole bunch of our residents are headed to Burning Man. So there's a lot of exposure to emergency medicine outside of the ED as well. Um, beyond that, we have uh, six fellowships. Uh, we have MedEd, Ultrasound, SIM, 
PEM admin and EMS. So we have a ton of um, fellowship trained faculty, which you will get to learn from and a lot of fellows who are there. And I think, again, my favorite part of all of these fellows coming in from all across the country is we constantly have um, new people coming in from different places who um, are able to share their experiences from where they've come from and bring um, a little bit of expertise that we may not have uh, in our already on our faculty that's already here. So um, tons of exposure to unique things. I think, um, you know, I all of our contact information is here at the bottom. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at any point. Um, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, who do we have up next? Looks like Dr. Caputo from Northwell at Staten Island. I don't see him online. Is he there? Oh, here he is. Billy, you're up. At probably the worst time, but um, I'm Billy Caputo. I'm the program director at Staten Island University Hospital. We have 30 residents, three residents, um, 10 residents per class. Um, we are located on Staten Island. So there's three hospitals on Staten Island for half a million people. And we actually service two of those three hospitals uh, for it. So we have a huge population that's very sick. Um, our residents have a lot of fun. So if uh, you get anything out of this, please follow our resident Instagram account. That's going to be on the uh, next slide. It's really going to give you an inside look at what residents' life is like. Our residents have protected uh, Tuesday nights. They're at conference every Wednesday. Um, so they really get to spend a lot of time together. Uh, the fellowships we offer are in education, admin, international medicine, and ultrasound. One of our ED attendings is the director of international medicine for all of Northwell. That's Dr. Eric Choi Pena, who I did residency with. Um, something cool that we do here is we do have the procedure team as well. Uh, so uh, we get a ton of procedures already, but um, our third year residents actually do uh, procedures on admitted patients. So we get consulted almost like interventional radiology where we're doing all the paracentesis, all the lumbar punctures, um, dialysis access, midlines, et cetera, et cetera, um, for it. Um, we do like to develop great speakers at our program. Uh, so we host the uh, regional Battle for the Borough lecturing competition uh, every single year with a bunch of other programs here on this call. We have a very active ultrasound division. Our residents graduate with probably over a thousand scans each. Um, by the time they do three years here, we're starting TEE training as well. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Emily. Um, we've also started a podcast. So one of our attendings is, uh, is Dr. S uh, Anand Swami Nathan. Uh, he's our medical education fellowship director with our with uh, Dr. Abbas Hussein. Uh, so residents who want to learn podcasting and everything, uh, that's something that we uh, are doing and likely going to actually teach medical students shortly. Um, all of this stuff is available on our website, which is statenislandem.com. So please come check us out. Thank you. Uh, Emily and Claudia for putting this event together. We look forward to seeing and reviewing everyone's applications. Thanks so much, Dr. Caputo. All right, so we are going to backtrack a little bit um, to upstate with Dr. Andonian. Hi, everybody. My name is David Andonian. I'm the program director for Upstate Emergency Medicine in Syracuse, New York. Uh, we are actually in New York, uh, but a little further out of the city than some people might uh, want to venture. But I will tell you that there's something really fun about uh, being in Syracuse uh, for a kid who was born and raised in New York, did my residency uh, in the Bronx at Lincoln Hospital. I get uh, the appeal of New York, but uh, if you're looking for something where you can kind of get the inner city feel at work without having to live in the inner city, that's kind of where we really uh, have our niche. Uh, we're about four hours. Uh, three and a half hours north of Yankee Stadium. 
Um, we are uh, the biggest hospital system, I suppose, or at least the busiest level one trauma center outside of the five boroughs. And we have the largest encashment in the state of New York. So we have a massive volume with an extremely high volume of trauma um, that is uh, mixed with a tremendous amount of polytrauma, things that normally uh, New York hospitals don't see that are, you know, in my residency, we did lots of, you know, assault, stabbings, GSWs, that sort of thing. Uh, what we see in upstate New York is a lot of that because the inner city of Syracuse is littered with gangs, unfortunately, uh, a lot of inner city section eight problems, but we also have the outer city. We have the suburbs and the burbs. We have uh, boating accidents and skiing accidents, ATVs, UTVs, all of the outdoorsy kind of stuff uh, that uh, brings a tremendous amount of unfortunate accidents from a very large encatchment in the state of New York, um, mixed with a tremendous amount of acuity and being the only tertiary care hospital that serves this region. Uh, so it's an interesting mix um, with, a, with a very interesting uh, level of acuity that I really don't think that I would have expected to be here uh, from moving out of the city and moving up here. Um, we have almost every specialty here uh, as far as fellowship, um, EMS, hyperbaric, and wound care. We have uh, one of the most robust pediatric emergency medicine fellowships. We also have a small growing med ed fellowship. We have a sports medicine fellowship that started last year. We have an international wilderness fellowship. Um, ultrasound is a big fellowship for us here. Uh, so a lot of opportunity to learn, not only necessarily from the perspective of, well, if I go into residency and I want to train or subspecialize, there is an opportunity for me to stay within the system. But you also get, like all of these other programs that you're hearing from, having those fellowships in-house provides you with access to fellow uh, faculty that are fellowship trained, that are working in academic medicine. So you're getting specialty education. We also have the Tox Fellowship, and we are the the upstate New York Poison Control Center. So outside of the five boroughs, we cover all the poison control calls. Um, so the toxicologists that cover the state of New York outside of the boroughs are up here as well. So you get a lot of amazing uh, access to learning uh, while you're up in Syracuse, not far from the city, but far enough where if you're looking for something a little bit more suburban rather than uh, frankly rural, um, it's, it's a great, amazing place to raise a family if, uh, if that's the point in the life that you're in. Um, really uh, beautiful areas uh, in and around the Finger Lakes, uh, which is where my family and I live. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting mix uh, of lifestyle here where you can get a lot of the urban and, and sort of, uh, you know, high volume, high acuity emergency medicine training without, again, having to sort of live inside of the borough, if you will. Um, and so that's, that's kind of us. Uh, we've actually expanded our ability to accept uh, a larger volume of visiting students. So um, if there are any students out there that would like to come and do an AI, uh, we're extremely intent and welcoming of anybody that'd like to come and visit with us. Um, what, what is the uh, average uh, um, medical student level that we're seeing right now in this group? Mostly twos, ones, threes, what, what do we got here? I know on our board, we've got a range of every class from both MD and DO programs. Um, and okay. for RSVPs, it looked similar. Well, we're, I mean, as far as MD versus DO, like we don't discriminate, if you will. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really excited to see that the world is kind of changing from that perspective. We, once uh, once you, you get into medical school, the MD versus the DO is not uh, necessarily a factor for us at all. Uh, my wife is a DO. Uh, I'm a Caribbean graduate myself, so you're going to be in a pretty eclectic group of people. Uh, we've got faculty from all different states and all different schools. So I think that the diversity from our program brings a tremendous opportunity for learning uh, different perspectives and cultures. Um, and we would welcome any, any resident or excuse me, any student that would like to come and do an elective with us. Uh, like I said, we've made uh, additional spaces to accommodate for visiting students from MD and DO programs in all 50 states. So if you'd like to come and visit with us, we'd love to have you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dr. Andonian. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And thanks everyone for being uh, flexible with the schedule. Um, we're flexible in EM. So let's travel back uh, downstate. I believe we have 
NYP Queens next with Dr. Simon. Oh, hey everyone. Uh, all right, that was really quick. Uh, well, hi everyone. My name is Dave. I'm one of the APDs at New York Presbyterian Queens along these beautiful people right here. Um, I get to do something that I love doing every day is teaching. Um, just going through everyone, we have Dr. Parikh. He's our program director on the left-hand side. In the middle is Dr. Yoneda, who's the associate program director. And then we have Dr. Louie, who is my APD partner in crime. I actually found Queens when I rotated here on a sub I, and I just fell in love with everything it had to offer. I did my residency here and I even completed a simulation fellowship. So I'm gonna do this quick two minute talk and show you a little bit of what NYPQ can uh, offer. Yeah, we are a three year program. We have nine residents per year and we have over 100,000 ED visits a year as well. We have all these fancy words like level one trauma, STEMI, stroke center, thrombectomy, um, but something more importantly, and some of these are these other things I'm gonna talk about. Uh, we have a mix of eight hour and 12 hour shifts, which is something super important to the well being of the residents. Queens is super diverse, not only in the patient population, but in pathology. And every day it still amazes me what I see. Along with the diversity comes a ton of procedures. And on that right hand side is just a list of one of the residents procedure logs that they were able to accomplish. So like I wrote, just get ready to get your hands dirty if you come here. We offer four fellowships. On the left, you see there's ultrasound, we have simulation and representing sim, um, we have med ed, and then we have admin. And something we're really proud of is our conferences. We spend a lot of our time planning every single week for it to not only be educational, but engaging and more importantly, fun. We all have a very hard time sitting still for more than a half hour. I know I do. And uh, other than I'll fall asleep. So we have to make it engaging. We have simulation every single week for all the residents. We have small groups and we're constantly being moved around. We try to make everything um, just hands-on as much as we could. Um, instead of me talking about it, I wanted to include a picture, but it's a little blurry, but it's okay. I'm going to include our website in the chat and that will have everything on it. We'll give you our actual schedule that you could look at what we're doing in our conference. It will go into our blog post. It will go into all these photos and everything else. Um, I included my email, so please, if anyone has any questions at all, if they want to ask me offline, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Definitely check out this website. I'll post it here. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Simon. Up next, we have Dr. Johnson from Stony Brook. Hi, everybody. My name's Scott, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity for uh, having us uh, on this awesome forum and uh, share a little bit about our program. You can move the next slide, Emily. Thanks. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, there's some amazing programs in, in our state, as Dr. Bodkin had said, and, you know, listening to him, I think we have some similarities with Syracuse and being you know, a suburban shop with a quaternary care center uh, with a focus on diversity and critical care. Uh, and like uh, the other programs, you know, we have a quaternary care center, we have 110,000 um, ED visits, uh, most of which are I said most of which, many of which are critically ill. And one of our advantages or, or unique aspects of our shop is that we have an EDICU, a 25 bed EDICU, where we take care of our sickest uh, and most injured patients. So, again, with the Regional Pern Center, we're in Suffolk County, which is uh, about 2,600 square miles uh, in southeast New York, where um, the, the most eastern two thirds of the island. 
uh, our population is 1.6 million. And as you know, most people would perceive being sub a suburb of uh, the, the city as having entitled folks and, and not much um, disenfranchised, we actually have a fair amount of disenfranchised in our county. And about 15% um, are impoverished and marginalized. We have about 30% uh, of our population is Spanish speaking only. So we actually have two human being Spanish translators in our shop, which is uh, invaluable to those of us who are not fluent in Spanish to be able to, you know, to navigate that patient encounter effectively. Uh, we are a STEMI PCI Center Comprehensive Stroke Center. In fact, we have two mobile stroke units, which we deploy into in our county. Uh, and we actually do CTs out in the field. Our residents rotate through that, uh, as well as critical care transfers. Uh, we're an ECMO Center, VADS program, and a kidney transplant center. Uh, we have our own children's hospital. Uh, and much like Syracuse, we, we have our quaternary care center, but we value highly our experience in the community. So we have a community experience in each of our three years. Our interns go to the VA Medical Center. Uh, our second years go to, a, to Good Sam Hospital, which actually has a, an osteopathic EM program, but it's a large community site and the practice of emergency medicine is very different than how we practice at Stony Brook. Uh, and then lastly, we have a small rural hospital out on the east end of Long Island, which is akin to a, a critical access shop where our residents really enjoy that practice because it's really uh, resource poor and they really learn how to practice emergency medicine, develop their skill set in a completely different way uh, than they do in a quaternary care shop. They learn how to transfer patients, they know how to manage patients uh, without a cath lab immediately available. Uh, so it is really a valuable experience, particularly for those who are going on to a career in uh, community emergency medicine. Uh, we have 16 residents per class. We're a three-year program. Uh, we do nine-hour shifts. We uh, we used to be a 12-hour shift shop, um, but for wellness purposes, because you know, as we all know, 12-hour shifts are never 12 hours. They're 13 hours, 14 hours, and you know that that's not good for anybody's health. So you know, we actually had to coerce the residents to uh, to pilot a nine-hour uh, shift, and uh, they unanimously uh, voted for it, and it allows us to overlap the shifts. Uh, so all of our shifts are nine hours, and uh, and that's kind of found the sweet spot for resident wellness. Um, we do 13 blocks a year, uh, 14 weeks of vacation. Um, again, we have uh, we have our own pediatric ED. We have a um, you can go to the next slide, Emily. Sorry. We actually kind of did a little bit of a copy and paste. Uh, uh, that's cool. No worries. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, for fellowships, we have uh, we have a PEM fellowship. We have a resuscitation fellowship. It was kind of unique. So our EDICU is a 25-bed unit. And as I alluded to before, we take care of our sickest patients there. Uh, and we have a our practice is somewhat unique in that we manage our critically ill patients for up to 24 hours. So we don't necessarily have deferential to our ICUs. If we can manage them, uh, we will keep them in our ED and manage them through stability and oftentimes to discharge. Uh, we have a fantastic um, set of nurses. We have a fantastic um, ancillary services. So our physicians, our residents really can focus on being doctors and and not necessarily have to worry about you know non-clinical tasks. Uh, another advantage of our shop is that we are affiliated with a school of medicine and a health sciences center. So we have myriad of students who rotate through our emergency department on a regular basis. And because we're a school of medicine with a required EM clerkship, we often have medical students on a weekly basis coming through sim labs and procedure labs, and our residents are, are an integral part of, of educating our medical students, and not just in emergency medicine, but at ultrasound. As a department, we're charged with teaching our medical students ultrasound, uh, so they have a, you know, a, a many opportunities to teach them. In fact, we actually incentivize our student, our residents, I'm sorry, for teaching our medical students. For every hour they teach a resident, oh, sorry, a student outside of the ED, uh, they get one hour toward a shift reduction. So it's a it's a one for one. If they're out, if they're you know um, committed to teaching and they're devoting their free time to teaching our medical students, we will um, give them one hour uh, for, for towards a shift reduction. So once they hit nine hours of teaching, they can have a shift reduction uh, of their choice in a future block. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, I apologize. I am jacked up on on a uh, energy drink right now because I'm exhausted after uh, a long hard day. So I apologize. If I'm I, I I feel very scattered and frenetic, and I apologize for that. But thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to uh, to talk about our program.
No need at all to apologize. I love the energy and thank you for being here <laughs> even after a long day. Um, and my wonderful technical skills have allowed us to skip actually accidentally um, North Shore LIJ uh, affiliated with Zucker School of Medicine, but that was not on purpose. I was actually born at this hospital center. So, all right, Dr. Pereira, please take it away. I love my, my job. Uh, this is the most fun thing that I can possibly imagine doing. Uh, I walk into a shift on Tuesday, uh, didn't even finish getting sign out when we had a motorcycle accident uh, that was coming in. So comes in, uh, GCS is 13, basically just grunting. I can't get much more out of him. Just his shredded uh, with uh, a lot of road rash. Uh, we end up intubating him with a glide scope, uh, inline stabilization. Uh, we can't even get him to CAT scan to get the head CT that we want because the EFAST shows that he has a pneumothorax uh, on one side. Uh, so we get the chest tube in before he goes off to CAT scan. And you're just sitting there going, this is what I wanted to be doing. Uh, and it is fantastic. Um, so, so we are uh, Zucker. We are uh, a three-year program on Long Island. Um, you wouldn't think that there would be as much trauma on Long Island, but people on Long Island hate each other. Uh, they go stabby stabby and they drive terribly. Uh, so it seems like uh, there is a, a wonderful for us, but terrible for public health, uh, never ending stream of trauma. Um, the way we do trauma is uh, we got a bunch of hospitals that are all Northwell. We go to uh, a bunch of them. There are 23 hospitals in total. Uh, we have two main hospitals. One of them is a, a level one trauma center. So that's the, the surgeon on one side of the bed, us on the other. We're always doing the airway uh, and everybody gets transferred in there and it's awesome. Uh, two miles away is our other main site, which is a level two trauma center, sits in Queens. Um, and because it's in Queens, you get just as much trauma. But when something comes in, it's all emergency medicine. Uh, we do all the peds trauma uh, over at the Cohen's Children's Hospital, uh, and we get a ton of trauma experience in the community. Um, but we felt like we weren't getting enough of the uh, guns. Uh, so we send our residents down to shock trauma in Baltimore for a month. And you think about it and you're like, wait, that's a that's a really rounded trauma experience. Uh, and you're right. Uh, and we try to do that for everything where we think that sort of a rounded experience is going to make you a better doc. So when you when you rotate in pediatrics, we have you go to Cohen's children and learn from like peds trained, wonderful people. Uh, you're in peds anesthesia for two weeks. You're in the PICU, you get that experience, but I also want you to have the longitudinal experience. So when you're in the LIJ ED, uh, every, uh, sorry, the North Shore ED, uh, one shift in a block will be in pediatrics. So you get that seasonal aspect. Uh, and when you come out, you're really comfortable with pediatrics. And we try to do that for all the things we do. Uh, a lot of these uh, programs have talked about fellowships. We have a fellowship in just about everything. Uh, and uh, we we find that a lot of our residents want to stay um, because they really like where they work and the community that we've created. Um, uh, as I said, I, I love my job. Uh, and uh, I really hope that all of you or any of you can be as happy uh, with the job that you are in uh, as I am now when you are 30 years into it. So any questions, uh, I'll pop my website into the chat box, um, but we'd love to get a chance to, to meet the good students out there. Uh, and thanks for letting me talk. Wonderful, thank you so much for being here and talking. All right, so we actually seem to be quite ahead of schedule. Um, I believe that was all the program directors who are here. And so we actually have a lot of time for Q&A and hopefully a lot of the PDs and APDs here can stay. Um, but if at any point anyone has to go, no worries. Um, just wanted to give a, another thank you to everyone for presenting information about their program to all the students here. We're kind of right 
you know, in the beginning of application season. So it's the perfect time to hear about your different programs. Um, so I'm actually going to turn it over to Claudia, my colleague, who is the vice chair of NYE MSC, and she's going to kind of run the Q&A session uh, in a structured way. So take it away, Claudia, and I'll stop my screen share. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Emily, for being such a great moderator. So how we're going to run the Q&A, we actually got a lot of submitted questions. So we just uh, picked from a few questions and we'll um, say the question. And then I'm going to choose maybe two PDs or APDs to answer the question and then move on to the next question. And hopefully we have some extra time in the end. So the first question is, what are the most important qualities your program looks for in an applicant? And I'll have Dr. Andonian and Dr. Caputo um, say your answers if you have some. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. So... Um... This is obviously a very common question. So I'll tell you the three things that I really want. Um, I want you to be kind, like really kind. We are very close, very close knit, uh, very, I know that people say this all the time, like, oh, we're like a big family. Like we really are a very big family. We do, the residents and myself and the other core faculty spend more time with each other than we do with any other group of, of friends outside of our nuclear family. So I want, somebody that's going to like really embrace that culture that we've worked very hard to cultivate here and really be a part of that. Um, so I want you to be kind and I want you to be loving and lovable and, and really sort of embrace that, what we have here. I want you to be very humble. I want you to be able to identify the things that you do imperfectly because we all are imperfect. Um, and I want you to be really hungry. I want you to be hungry for every opportunity for you to learn, every opportunity for you to take on a procedure to see another patient. And it doesn't matter how sick or not sick that they are. There is something to be learned from every experience with every patient, good, bad, or indifferent. There's something to learn. Even the frequent flyer that's begging you for, for dilaudid or your fancy chicken sandwiches or your, or your turkey on dry whole wheat bread with no mayonnaise and a crusty piece of cheese, that person is going to bring something for you to learn from. Because one day when you're in attending, however much you feel that there is no medicine to learn there, the ability to manage the entire emergency department along with these frequent flyers that have nowhere else to go, that's something to be learned. So be humble and be hungry to learn in every opportunity that you are approached with. And if you can be kind and you can be humble and you remain hungry, I'll teach you the rest. I will teach you everything you need to know. And this program will support you through all the different steps that it takes for you to be a great, great ER doc. But if you cannot come with those three things, it's going to take some soul searching for you in any specialty to find the ability to dig deep and find the humility to, to, to really embrace those qualities. And so for me, I don't want, I don't want, I don't care about your grades. I mean, as long as you are actually passing your exams, I think that that's kind of a minimum, but beyond that, like, I don't really care. I don't care where you went to school. If your letters speak volumes for the for the hard work and the hunger that you have, and you are a kind, hospitable, generous person, like I'm in. And that's all I want. I don't want anything else. I will teach you the rest. Thank you for that insightful response. Um, Dr. Caputo, are you present? I know that he, he looked like he was in the car. I, might, I, I can text him. I don't know if he's still on. I'm not seeing him in the participants list anymore. Okay. No worries. Thank you, Ren. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we can have uh, Dr. Pereira, if you want to answer that one as well. Um, so, I can read the question. Uh, I mentioned that um, we have every subspecialty in the world. Uh, when I came into emergency medicine, uh, I thought I was going to be the best community doc uh, that was out there. Uh, I I love seeing patients, and I thought that was my thing. Uh, and it took until I was a chief resident and was put into the education role to make me just fall in love with being in front of a classroom and teaching. Uh, so the the residents, the, the the students that I'm looking for are people who show up wanting to try everything. 
that they want to they don't know anything necessarily about what it means to be a toxicologist but they go into a tox rotation uh full bore uh they go and do their sports medicine uh and what happens is so many people fall in love with something that they never had the exposure to uh that uh, the biggest shame of residency would be to show up and not take advantage of all of the things that are put in front of you, the, the working, the marathon, the all of the different events going on. So what am I looking for? I'm looking for, if you look at an application, you, you see those people who have been willing to go out there and try things. Uh, and so I'm looking for people who are going to take advantage of all of the opportunities that are available in residency. Okay, great. So we're gonna move on to the next question. Um, the next question was, uh, what are your favorite things about your program? And what are some things you would change about your program? Um, we are gonna go to Dr. Camacho. Oh, and um, Dr. Botkin. So whoever wants to go first. Uh, okay, I can go first. One of the things, I mean, I did residency at County, so I'm a little bit biased. So I think <laughs> my program is the best program. And one of the things that for me was really cool is like the first time that I arrived, I saw that there was like people from many walks of life was like super interesting for me because I went to other places and the majority of people were people that I can I wasn't able to identify with. And that for me is uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about County. That is someone that understand me that I can communicate also in my primary language that is Spanish that I put reggaeton and they're like dancing with me and like dancing salsa and that is something that came like really like naturally and I think that that is something that I am really yeah, comfortable with I'm very proud of and I will keep working on that I mean things to change New York City so many patients all the time it's like non-stop um of course I work in a county system so um there's a lot of things that is not under my control. A lot of patients, I have to do a lot of primary care. Also, and sometimes I have to carry pee to the lab or like push patient to CAT scan. And that is something that I wish that it can be different, but it is what it is. It's a very busy place. And that also teach me a lot. Like I'm very comfortable putting IBs in your forehead if I need to, because I did it a lot as a resident. And, you know, there's like positive and negative things of working in a county environment, but that for me was always like positive, be able to keep myself humble and the things are still that I, some people think there are no physician jobs, which they are not, but I will do anything for my patients to just make them safer. So I would say um, for the University of Rochester, my uh, favorite part is a very classic answer to people, but I'll give you something more specific. But um, I trained at the University of Rochester, so I feel similar um, that I think it's a great program, one of the best programs in the country. And we really just have wonderful, wonderful people. And I received outstanding mentorship and really grew as a person and as a physician while I was there. So I found that actually phenomenal. Um the part I really love about our program that I feel like we are a very dynamic program. We're a program that has a lot of humility and a leadership group that has a lot of understanding that residents really know what's happening on the ground level and are absolutely willing to modify, change, and adjust our program to fit the needs of what the residents want and what's currently going on in our practice pattern. So we are constantly changing every month, every year, as much as we can to fit the needs of what the residents want and take feedback incredibly seriously. And we're really humble and know when things need to change and are willing to make those sacrifices and changes for our residents. So we're a program that is not stagnant and a program that hears what residents want and need and make changes and adjustments. And I'm really proud of ourselves for doing that because it's a hard thing to do. It's easy to just hit repeat each year and do the same thing over and over and over again. Something I would change it, you know, it's a, uh, I think there's a lot of <laughs> issues within emergency medicine right now. So I could uh, laundry list things that we would probably all want to change about not necessarily our programs, but the specialty itself. Um, but I would actually want more time with my residents. I think we have so much to teach them and so much to offer them um, that if I could change one thing, I'd actually want them to stay in our program longer. I think that there's so many experiences and opportunities that we have, elective opportunities, um, educational experiences that if we had more time with them, I think that they could grow even more, but you got to let them out of the nest sometimes. So we can't keep them forever. Thank you for those responses. Um, our next question is, what qualities about your program made your current residents choose your program? Uh, we'll have Dr. Modi um, and Dr. Johnson uh, answer these. Thank you first. Um, 
you know, I, I think someone else just said this before. I think maybe Dr. Bodkin, but um, the people, I think that um, one of the biggest reasons that our, our residents have chosen to come is because our residents, again, like so many people have said, are truly like family. They love each other. They all like, it's so heartwarming to see not only the current residents who connect with each other, but they've connected with the residents who have graduated before them. They keep in touch with alumni and you have these like little MIMO families that have formed at other programs across the country. Um, and it's really cool to see how they connect here and then they continue to connect as they, they grow up and they leave us. Um, but it's so cool to always see them come together. So I would definitely say the people is the biggest reason that people come. Um, the second reason I would say is the acuity. I think we have really, really, really sick patients. Um, and I think our residents work extremely hard um, to take care of these patients. And so they learn a lot and they leave our program and they go to community hospitals, they go to fellowship, they leave the country and work in other countries um, and feel comfortable taking care of patients anywhere that they go with any kind of um, illnesses that they come in with. So I think really good training um, is the second thing. I think if you can practice that at MIMO, you can go really anywhere and, and do well. Um, and I'd say the third thing is probably, um, I'd like to think the support. Um, we really value our residents being happy. And so, um, you know, if you're like, Emergency medicine is hard and um, our specialty in general right now is going through so much. And so if you have interests that like, for example, one of our residents is really in to addiction medicine and one of our attendings um, runs an addiction medicine clinic once a week. And so um, we sent him to do that. He does that once a week, every Wednesday, he goes to addiction clinic and spends time there. And although it's not like a traditional emergency medicine shift, um, it's part of his training. Um, like one of our other attendings runs an obesity clinic. And that's something that one of our residents has an interest in. So we're able to send her to spend time there. So emergency medicine has such a large scope and we really try and support our residents um, to be able to not only practice as really good emergency medicine physicians, but also get exposure to other things that emergency medicine physicians do. We do a little bit of everything. Um, and so I think uh, that support for our residents, helping them find what makes them happy um, and supporting them in what they want to do, I think is another big draw to our program. Um, I think I have so many more, but uh, I'll stop there. I think those are the big three. So, you know, it's going to be a common theme and I'll certainly reiterate, you know, the family, community, camaraderie and supportive environment. And at the end of the day, you know, as emergency physicians, you know, we're, it's a team sport, right? So I think the, our specialty attracts folks who see the value uh, of being able to establish rapport with a patient uh, to have an impact on them. Not again, not just saving a life, but just having an impact on every single patient that they encounter. So I think we just attract folks, students who really embrace that opportunity. Uh, and as emergency physicians, uh, you know, again, we, we value the humanistic qualities, the camaraderie. So we all, we all have, you know, um, the sense of family and support. And I, I would challenge any applicant to go to a, to a residency program, emergency medicine, uh, and not find that, you know, I think that's, uh, it would be, um, you know, It'd be very unusual to find a residency program that would be toxic, you know, and we all practice emergency medicine. We see it in other specialties. It's much more common than, than in our specialty. So, you know, again, I, I will just reiterate that, you know, when I, you ask residents you know, what attracted you to Stony Brook, because we're in the suburbs and, you know, and honestly, you know, the city is attractive, you know, for all the things that the city can offer someone, particularly if you're single uh, on your, your life outside of work, you know, so the suburbs don't necessarily have that kind of sexiness, but, uh, you know, so we attract folks who have families where we live in a suburb with fantastic school systems so their children can grow up in the, the three zero three years or more they're doing fellowships uh that they really know that their children can be in a fantastic school system and they can raise their family while training in emergency medicine so i think we offer that in the suburbs but still they're not losing any of the acuity uh, of patients again being a level one trauma center 110,000 folks that we see we see disenfranchised disenfranchised we see diversity uh, so they get that as well as being in the suburbs. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, we find that students, you know, want to train in a place that they want to live, you know, that they certain envision 
and where they see their future. And they often want to practice in that environment. I don't think that necessarily makes sense. I think you can train at the best program that fits your interests and not necessarily geographically where you want to live. Cause you can always obviously do that once you've graduated and go anywhere you like with emergency medicine. Again, another advantage of our specialty. Um, so again, I, we have, you know, I think a credibly supportive environment and like Dr. Bach in Syracuse, we're a very, resident driven program and that we are always looking for feedback and we always need to really change and customize our curriculum to our learners, our present learners, because what worked five years ago will not work today with our current learners. And we have different educators and our rotations change. So we always had to be on top of that on a regular basis and really get resident feedback. So if nothing's not, something's not working and there's no educational value, you know, we will change it on the fly right then and there and make modifications. If we can't change it, uh, then we'll look for some other way to achieve that educational goal. So I think that responsiveness, that kind of resident driven um, program that we have, I think is important. You know, and again, I think, you know, the clinical aspects are that, you know, we do have this opportunity to teach. So as a three-year program, I think, you know, we we send about 60% of our, our graduates go into an academic um, job, which is kind of cool because you know, usually, you know, historically the four-year programs have that extra year where they can really, you know, dive deeply and train their residents as educators and academicians where the, the three years historically have been, you know, the community physicians. And we are, we have our programs for us since 1990. So we're a long, you know, long-standing program. So we try to leverage our opportunities with our uh, school of medicine or health sciences centers and our teaching to really create academicians out of a three-year program. And again, our critical care opportunities, I think are, are unique and now we have an EDICU and our residents really get procedurally facile and managing, you know, all the, you know, really deeply into critical care. Uh, and uh, they often go into fellowships. About 60% of our residents go into fellowship training, uh, which is also kind of cool, uh, I think, at a three-year program. Thank you for those responses. They made me even more excited to go into EM residency. Um, we're going to go on to our next question, which is, how heavily are slows and away rotations at specific locations weighed in the application process? Uh, this question, we're going to go to Dr. Andonian and Dr. Camacho. Um, could you be a little bit more specific about what you mean by slows being weighed from different programs? Like, are you, are you asking me like one specific slow versus another or slows in general? Sorry, I think the question was more slows in general, but the away rotations at specific locations. I would like to see that you had the opportunity. Okay, um, so slows are obviously extremely important for us. I think that um, over the last seven years now of reviewing applicants, um, well, I guess eight really, if you count my chief year, it, it becomes a little... The idea of having a slow is supposed to be something where we're able to, from the leadership perspective, we're able to compare your letter to the others in somewhat of a Likert scale and trying to quantify where do we think that you'd fall into our list. And that's supposed to, we're supposed to talk to each other, so to speak, from program to program and say like, this person is going to be in our sort of top third and compared to their peers, this is where we think they are. It seems like the way that programs across the 50 states use those scales are starting to vary a lot. And I think that over time, we've all probably learned which programs have a tendency to put everybody in the top third, the middle third, nobody in the bottom third. Uh, and I'm getting some shaking heads. Uh, Dr. Camacho is shaking her head. Yes. Like it's a little wonky, right? And like Giovanni saying the same thing, it, like it, it's, I, I really wish that there was a way to capture the essence of what the slow was supposed to be. Um, but I feel like some of those attempts at standardizing, and when I did the teaching fellowship a few years ago, the, the core leadership was at the fellowship and they were talking about, we're gonna change it, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. I honestly haven't seen much of a change at all, though some tweaks. Ultimately, my answer to the question is, it's not as valuable in the classical sense of what a slow was supposed to be compared to another letter. And that's the unfortunate reality. I think that it, if somebody puts you in the bottom third, that that kind of condemns you because a third of the people need to be in the bottom third. That doesn't mean that they're not matchable, but that's how the culture of these letters have morphed. So I try really hard not to really put a lot of weight into some of those Likert scaled things in the slow because I'm not sure that people are using it in the same way. And if you're using it the right way, one third of your letters should be in the bottom third. 
raise set of hands. How many people put people in the bottom? Like, I think that we're the one of the only programs that do. And I'm starting to worry about if I write my letters the right way, am I condemning our students by putting them in the bottom third? So now like, I'm kind of nervous about it. I don't know how to handle that. And to be honest, like, I'd love to ask the question to the rest of the PDs here. Like, what are y'all doing? Because I'm kind of afraid of slows, to be honest. Um, so to all of those points, the, 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 the ultimate bottom line for me is that I want to see what the narrative says, just like any other letter. But the nice thing about the slow and the narrative is that it's a much smaller component of the whole letter. So the, what I've noticed is that it's usually a very concise narrative. There's not a lot of fluff in there. I've known this person for 37 years. Their cat's name is Bingo. Like a lot of that is missing in the slow narrative. But what does end up going in there are some of the buzzwords. Diligent, hardworking, committed, omnipresent. And so those are the kind of things that I really want to see. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. And I don't want to sound too, you know, kissy face, huggy bear, but I really want to see those three things that I've talked about. I want to see the humility. I want to see the grit and determination and hard work. I want to see the kindness. I want to see the hunger. And if I can find the buzzwords that describe the essence of those qualities, I'm in. I'm in. All the other stuff, I think, starts to get very fluffy. I think that it's, you know, trying to Likert scale students becomes overly intellectualized and overly scientific. Like, it doesn't need to be like that. Just tell me that this person is hardworking and they're good and you pick them and be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm in for it. So I put a lot of weight into the slows because the letter at any point, whether it's a slow or a regular letter, is going to give me a narrative and paint a picture about what kind of a person you are because all the other stuff about your grades and your quartiles, like I can get that from your apps. You know, I don't need a letter to tell me that you're in the top one third. And if the letter is starting to perseverate over some of the details that are in your application, I again, start to worry like, does this person really know the applicant or are they just using the CV to reiterate a seemingly robust letter? So for you as the applicant, like, don't worry too much about it. Just go to your shifts, bust your butt, work as hard as you can. And if you do that, the things that you do on your shift, I promise you, will find their way to shine in your letter. That's what we do as leaders. The PDs, the APDs, the clerkship directors, like we know damn well what to say about those kind of kids. And if that's you, just, just let your work speak for itself. It'll show up in the letter. Don't overthink it. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. One of the things that when we start interview season recruitment, we always like meet and decide so what we're looking for, like what is specifically like what we want in this class and things that that is what I'm looking on letters, a specific like characteristic of students that are going to actually fit in our program. And also looking for red flags, like people that have like professional issues, like what was it? Like was late for three shifts or like other things that was different. So that is kind of like I'm, I'm looking on uh, on them also letters are important but also your application is like a complete package on everything so really it's like mostly for me is looking for things that are reflex something that I have to be aware of also when we have any questions also there's communication I can like communicate with like the PDO of another program like hey tell me what happened so also like being the lower like bottom or anything that doesn't mean anything if you are actually a good student and um, has uh, the other uh, participant uh, Antonio said there's people that are going to be there and that doesn't mean anything you're still a very like good candidate because at the end you're a complete uh, human there's a lot of other things from you that are also good and also I look for this uh, let me see how I can say that this in a proper way also I look for biases in the letters and I'm very defensive of students when people write mm -hmm. things that I don't like I don't need to know that a woman is happy and smiley and when I like read things like that on letter I already like get like oh I want to interview that person like don't tell like only for the other perspective, I want just to know a person without that qualities in there because I don't need to know that. I just want to know that you're a good doctor and you're going to be great. So I am like in the other way, like more like, ah, I want to just meet this person because I don't want to know that. That is not fair for that applicant. That's all the characteristic of this person that is they're really important. So I'm the one that in my, in my shop that is looking for all these things that are important for us. I'm very aware of that. And that is something that for me is important. 
I would completely agree with all of those things fully and fully. Thank you for those insightful responses. Um, since this is a more heavily um, asked question, we're going to open up this question to the floor if, any, if anybody else wants to answer it. And if anyone could speak to um, how heavily away rotations at specific locations are weighed as well and add in, uh, we have a few extra minutes for that. I guess I could comment. Um, I think if there's a place that you know that you want to go for some particular reason, geographic, family-based, things like that, you know, seeing and working with somebody for a month gives you a far better experience of that person than reading application and interviewing them for 20 or 30 minutes. So if you want to go off and show your skill set and show who you are and show that you can be a good emergency medicine physician for that program, going to that program and trying to do an away rotation at the program you want to go is very beneficial because it takes all the guesswork out of the match, right? I know for, for sure if this person can practice, if they're professional, if they get along with peers, if, do they get along with their residents? So in that particular respect, I think it really is powerful to go to a place work there for a month and show off your skills. Now, your schedules aren't always going to line up. You may not be able to get into that place. They may not have spots open. There's lots of reasons that you may not be able to. And it certainly doesn't uh, you know, prevent your ability from getting in there. I think in general, having an AA rotation where a different program looks at you and objectively evaluates you and sends a slowly to me is helpful, right? Because we like our students. We like the U of our students. We usually write them strong, strong letters. They're usually strong students. But also when I'm reading programs, letters, I like to see them practice somewhere else to get an unbiased view or a less biased view maybe of their clinical skills and their ability to work in a different environment because emergency medicine is highly variable. You can work in different rotations and all over the place. So I think there is benefit to having an away slowy. I don't really care where it comes from. I don't care if it comes from the U of R or Syracuse or Buffalo or Albany or one of the city programs. These are all my colleagues. I know that they know how to evaluate students. And if they write that the student can practice well and can do emergency medicine, I believe them. So the particular place that it comes from doesn't really affect my opinion of the slowy. Also Especially for you, like going to a place also sometimes is not about you showing yourself. It's also like knowing us. What about if you go to a place to do residency and you hate it. You're going to be there for like three years. So is that is something that you maybe don't know anyone or four years or more? I don't know. So if you have any other, like, I don't know, I'm from Puerto Rico. So by chance, I love my program, but what about if I didn't? Like I, I didn't do all our rotations. So that's something also to like think that is also audition for us. I want to show you my best to see if you actually if we are fit. So also take it as that as an opportunity to know the program and understand that it's a place that you will go because it's four years is a long time. And if you really go to a place that you don't love it and you thought that it's going to be your place just by name or for whatever reason that you decide to go there, just be careful on that because that is going to be something that is going to change your life. You know. One other way that students have used this question uh, is... Uh, if someone is uh, born and raised in Texas, went to college in Texas, and went to medical school in Texas, and they've applied to a California program, uh, then often doing an away elective uh, just to show, hey, I am looking really to leave uh, the state that I'm in. It's a demonstrating interest sort of thing. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, my program uh, around New York. If somebody comes to New York in any program, then I know that they're willing to think about relocating to New York, even though, uh, like my application read, you know, Vermont, 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 and yet I fell in love with New York, and it worked out great. So some people use that away rotation to demonstrate interest. Um, I completely agree with what all of you guys have said. And I'll add, um, like if you, sorry, totally lost, lost my train of thought, but um, oh, sorry, I'm going to come back. I completely forgot what I was about to say. It's okay. I could, I could ask the question again, if maybe that would help. Uh, the question was how heavily are slows and away rotations at specific locations weighed in the application process? Oh, okay. Sorry. I remember. Thank you. That was what I needed. I was going to say, let's say you are from what you said, like you are from Texas and you did all of your training there. And yet for some reason you actually can't make it to New York to do a rotation. I really like when I review applications, like it's so nice to read, even if you put like something in your personal statement, like 
I want to be in New York for X reason. That tells me so much about you and why you might want to come here. And like, I'm someone who was born and raised in Michigan. Like I had no business being in New York and just being able to say like, oh, I'm, I'm married to someone who lives here. Like it, it makes it a lot easier for someone to understand why you want to come here. Um, and I will say New York is really unique. It has so much to offer. Um, but going back, like it's really important for you as an applicant to spend time here and see what New York is like, like living in New York, um, spending time here, working in the emergency departments here. They're very different than they are um, across the country. And so making sure that you're happy, I think, is the ultimate goal. We want our residents to be happy. Um, and obviously, you want to be happy where you're going to train for the next three or four years because it's a long time and you spend a lot of time um, at your program. And so you want to meet the people. You want to spend time with the residents. Like, honestly, going out with the residents is important. Seeing like, oh, OK, do people here have families? Are they all single? Are they all going out to the club till 4 a.m.? Like, do they do like soul cycle classes together? Like finding your people and finding the people that you're going to spend 80% of your time with, really important for you to like them. So as important it is, as it is for us to see you, it's really important for you to see us, meet us, make sure that you're going to be happy. And I, I would reiterate that, you know, we don't look at any one particular shop uh, and value is slow from them or devalue is slow from a particular shop. I think it's important, though, you know, for an applicant, um, again, reiterating what other people have said, that it, if you're not quite sure what practice you want, it would behoove you not just to do an audition to where you'd like to go, but also try different practice styles. Go to a county program in an urban shop, which can be very different than the pace and the volume of a smaller rural shop or community shop. and it, you know, you don't want to go to just two urban shops and then go to a residency program and think, and then you don't like it, right? Or you don't fit in. And like when, as program directors, we all know when we see a slow, you know, we we can appreciate where it's coming from, right? As Dr. Andoni had mentioned, you know, there are some places which are a little disingenuous in their grading scale. Uh, and you have to kind of see through that fluff. And you have to look through that and look at it, you know, a little more closely. And, you know, we also understand programs that are, are really, you know, difficult in their grading scale against some students and you know they're a little harsh and um i think you when you read through it and read the narrative again which is super important uh and not just the radio buttons and certainly not how they rank them because again again that oftentimes is disingenuous uh it's really about the narrative and i think you know again as if you're going if you're a student you know going on a rotation uh, again echoing a lot of what dr andonian said is that it's work ethic it's humility it's empathy and compassion because we don't expect at least i don't expect you know fourth year medical students to necessarily you know have all the knowledge or certainly have procedural proficiency because that's what we're going to teach them right it's really those humanistic qualities that we can teach right it's that ability that that, that so-called 3 a.m test where this is someone who if i'm alone with at three in the morning you know they are going to work beside me right they're going to work beside me they're going to work hard uh and they're going to do everything they can for their patients uh and again it's our job as as a residency program to give them knowledge to give them the procedural training uh and that's what we do for three or four years right so we, we bring in these folks uh, who just have that energy, have that humility and have that work ethic and compassion and empathy where they can, you know, they have this ability to, to establish a rapport with a patient quickly. And not only that, but, you know, work with nurses, again, being a team sport, you have to be respectful. You have to appreciate everybody's role in the ED. Uh, and, you know, as a student that, you know, as, as, um, program as CD as clerkship directors and APDs and PDs, you know, when we're evaluating you for slow, we see that we see that ability or inability to do that. And that will usually show through. And those are the folks who probably end up on the, you know, the lower third is because of those, those flaws, if you will, those, that, that lack of ability where we find valuable. And that's, I think, you know, if you, if you're a student, if you focus on your work ethic and, and your humility and your compassion, you will do well. So I don't, you don't have to crush the shelf exam. You know, you just show that you're that kind of person. And I think uh, most of us, I don't speak for other people, but I think we all value those, uh, those characteristics in an applicant. And, you know, we're willing to take, even if your scores are not great, we would absolutely take you into our program because we know that we can train you to be the, the best emergency position you can be. Thank you so much for that great discussion. Um, we're gonna try to squeeze in three more questions in these last um, six, seven minutes. Um, so the next question will be, how can IMGs strengthen their applications and stand out as candidates for the match? We're gonna have Dr. Modi 
and uh, answer this question. And we also wanted to introduce a surprise program that is joining us tonight that will join us after the Q&A um, to talk about his program. Um, but we also have Dr. Andrew Restivo here from um, Montefiore uh, Jacoby. And so we'll have Dr. Restivo also answer this after Dr. Modi. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thanks. So uh, I will just say that I don't care where you went to school. Um, someone said this prior to me, I forget who it was, I'm sorry, but whether you're a DO, an MD, whether you're an IMG, um, we really just want people who hardworking, who are excited, who are kind, who are, you know, we can teach you how to do a central line. We can teach you how to do a chest tube, but I can't teach you to be a nice person, right? I can't teach you to like help your co-resident out if they're sick or like switch shifts with someone so they can go to their friend's wedding, right? Like I can't teach you to do that, but I can teach you the medicine. I can teach you the procedure. So really, um, as you do your ways, um, and just show that to the people you're working with, um, show them that you're there to learn, show them that you're hardworking, show them that you're kind. Um, and that comes through in your application. Um, and again, I really, when I review these applications, I really value like the box, like the personal statement. I really value the boxes that say like, maybe this is like a, a difficult situation I had, or maybe my training was interrupted for X reason. And I urge you to use that because that tells me more about who you are. And like, Yes, all of these scores are important, but at the end of the day, like I want to know who you are. And if I read like a killer personal statement or I read like you had this thing that you went through and that shaped who you were as a person or, you know, it doesn't have to be a hard thing. It can even be like I worked um, in tech for five years before I came into medicine. That just tells me so much about who you are and makes me want to interview you, makes me want to talk to you, makes me want you to come to our program because you're going to bring something unique. But um, again, I don't think there's any one specific thing um, and I'm not going to expect more from you if you're coming from um, a foreign medical school versus a DO versus MD. I just want your application to be strong and for you to show me that you know, you're know you going to work hard, you're excited to be here. There's a reason that you're here um, and you want to be doing emergency medicine, not like I applied to 20 things and this is at the bottom of my list, right? Like those applications are very easy uh, to kind of see through. So as long as I think your application is genuine, um, it, it, I want to meet you and I want to talk to you and I want to see if you're going to be a good fit for our program. Yeah, I would have to definitely agree with what uh, Dr. Modi said. Um, I think the narrative is way more important than the numbers on the page and the places that you're from. It's really seeing sort of your life story um, and really capturing a lot of the qualities that a lot of the other PDs have mentioned in the past uh, 10 or so minutes about what makes a strong application, specifically, you know, your grit, your hunger for the profession, your desire to be there, and your ability to be, you know, empathetic to patients and work within a hospital system, work well with the nurses, well with the PCTs, because we can train you up to do all the skills that you need to do as an ER doc. Um, so it doesn't really matter necessarily the program that you're coming from. You really have to just hit it home, uh, you know, when you're doing your away rotations and doing your rotations um, in your clerkships as well. That's really what's more important, I think, to a lot of us on this panel than the numbers on the page, um, specifically like the step scores and things like that. And even the schools that you come from, it's really more about who you are as a person that I think is what we're trying to capture there. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next question. For DO applicants, is USMLE step one required in addition to having COMLEX level one scores to be considered? Additionally, do you highly recommend DO applicants to complete USMLE Step 2 along with Comlex Level 2 and have those scores ready to submit with the ERAS application? We're going to go to Dr. Camacho and Dr. Bodkin. No and no. As long as you take your licensing exams um, and pass them. I don't care which ones you take anymore. I think that a lot of programs have shifted that uh, reality as well, requiring students to take multiple tests in different specialties that cost money and time. I think it's just not the right way to look at things anymore. There are clear algorithms to compare the scores if people don't understand how to interpret them. And there's just no reason for DOs to be taking step tests on top of complex tests, in my opinion. So we don't uh, care which ones you take as long as you take them and pass them. That's it. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, places like us also, we are even, I don't even looking at the score of the first one because right now, like, it's like a, a step one is passed. So I just do the same thing with the complex. I don't even count it in my rubric to like holistic review. That doesn't matter to, to me anymore. So I don't think that that is necessarily really, at least in my program. So I don't know what other people 
belief in the other programs. Yeah. Oh, throw that we don't we don't uh, DOs do not need to take USMLE, and for the reasons that Dr. Botkin and Camacho just uh, you know spoke about, uh, there's no reason for them to have to you know do it to be competitive or to be on the same level playing field. I don't think that that argument exists anymore or it's weakened. Uh, and I think as long as they do well, and as Dr. Botkin said, you can interpret their comic scores and and see what it would be equivalent to the USMLE if that's something you're interested in seeing as far as their actual performance. Uh, so I, I think that's it's absolutely not necessary. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so our last question of the night, um, it's kind of in uh, line with the previous question, um, but can you still be competitive for EM residency with low step scores or even a failure? We're going to have um, Dr. Pereira and Dr. Recibo answer these. So I think everybody here has said the same thing, which is we do holistic application reviews. Uh, we care about people. Um, I was terrible on my scores, so it would be hypocritical of me to stand up and go, no, unless you got, I actually have never worked at a program that had a cutoff where we didn't interview people. Um, I, I think that how you do in your away rotation, I think it and how you do oddly on the interview uh, matters a ton. Uh, I think that that you absolutely can get into emergency medicine uh, with scores that are not perfect. Uh, clinical excellence does not require the ability to know when the answer is C. I, I totally agree. I think standardized tests are not a good uh, marker for clinical ability or clinical acumen, or certainly a predictor of how you're going to do as a clinician in your career. Um, I would say what sometimes is nice to see if you don't do well on a step one score, a step two score, to see that kind of level of improvement, because that also shows that you're able to grow as a person. So if you do really poorly on your step one, even though now it's pass fail, um, and your step two score is really good, that sort of gives us an indication that, hey, this person also, in addition to the rest of their holistic application, is somebody who can study and figure out challenges and overcome challenges. Um, but a mediocre test score in and of itself is not a um, something that we're going to use to to ban you from you know matching you or interviewing you by any stretch of the imagination. I will say that you should address it, though. Like, if you have a fail or multiple and also on your exams you should actually take maybe some line in your personal statement or something to address it because then that will explain a little bit more what happened or if not didn't know something didn't happen so why what do you learn from it like what is going to be different and how you like come overcome the challenge and that is the personal statement is a good place to do that Okay, I'm gonna thank everyone now for all the responses tonight um, for our Q&A session. We're gonna end it here. Um, if any of the panelists need to leave, we understand. We thank you so much for your time um, tonight. Otherwise, I'm gonna hand it over to Emily so we can introduce our surprise program. Yes, um, if anyone has to go, feel free, unless you wanna hang out with us a little more. Dr. Restivo from Jacoby is going to talk about his program. And I actually have some slides that he kindly provided. So I will cue those up. Nice, okay. So I'm from Jacoby Montefiore. Uh, we're associated with Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. We are one of the oldest programs in New York and one of the oldest programs in the country. Um, our three main sites, we're going to go through in these three slides very quickly. The first is Jacoby Medical Center, which is a level one trauma center. It's part of the Health and Hospital Corporation system in New York, which is one of the largest public health systems in the country, actually. Um, they see about 120,000 patients a year. Um, they are level one adult trauma center and a pediatric level two trauma center. We also have a burn center there and a hyperbaric center there and the hyperbaric serves most of the upper portion of the East Coast. So we'll have people flying in from upstate, um, occasionally from different states um, for various reasons and hyperba hyperbaric needs essentially. Um, we also are a regional snake bite center because we actually are very close to the Bronx Zoo. Um, and because of that, they have a large, obviously snake population and we can actually obtain antivenom from them. Um, so that really allows us to to be sort of the sole supplier of a lot of the antivenom that's used um, for snake bites around the area um, regionally um, and on the East Coast. Jacoby also just recently became a comprehensive stroke center. 
and a STEMI center. Um, so they now are able to take care of patients with STEMIs um, and strokes. And that's your main site for our residency. So you'll be doing most of your time at Jacoby. If you want to do the next slide. So Montefiore Moses is our other main campus and they are probably one of the busiest EDs in the country. They're a primary tertiary care center. They have a lot of subspecialty um, clinics. You'll see patients with who are coming in with LVAD, patients who are coming in with transplants because um, we're a pretty busy organ transplant center. We're also partnered with the Children's Hospital of Montefiore, which is a nationally known children's hospital. And like the adult hospital, they are also a tertiary care center. So you'll often see patients there with a lot of chronic diseases that you may not see in a community setting. Monty is also a stroke center, a STEMI center, and a reimplantation center. Um, and that's kind of cool because you'll have patients who come in with amputations, whether partial or complete, and Mon Monty, the Monty surgeons there, the transplant surgeons, are able to reattach them. So we have a lot of cool war stories as residents about what we saw in terms of the trauma um, from, from amputations. Um, next slide. So the last site that you guys will rotate at, the, the main site, would be Montefiore Einstein. So it's still part of the Montefiore umbrella. And we partnered with the Einstein School, um, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, about eight or nine years ago. And the Einstein Hospital is affiliated with the medical school. So that's about 10 minutes away from Jacoby. You'll spend about a th probably a third of your time over the four years with, with us at Einstein. It's also a tertiary care hospital. It's a community-style ED in the sense that you see adults and peds in the same space, which is kind of cool. Um, they see about 75,000 patients a year and are also a STEMI and stroke center. Um, and those are the three main sites that you rotate through. The, the pediatric EDs are located in Jacoby and uh, Montefiore and Moses. Einstein is primarily sort of a community center where you can see peds even during an adult shift that you're assigned to. And now I can open it for questions. Otherwise you keep talking forever and ever. All right. Looks like um, hopefully everyone's questions were answered. Um, we want to thank everyone again for your time. Um, thanks to all the PDs and APDs still here for lending us your valuable time, for being flexible with our scheduling surprises. Um, and thank you, Dr. Resto, for also coming on a little bit earlier than planned. Um, thank you guys for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, I hope this was a successful and fun event, an educational event for everyone, and look forward to seeing you on future events and maybe even on the interview trail. Have a great night, everyone. And this will be posted on YouTube. Thanks so much.